Congratulations, YouTube. You did it. You wore me down and you sucked me back in. I have too many subscribers here just to walk away entirely, especially with no alternative that truly stacks up and so many copycat channels uploading my shows for me anyway. But we can't forget the THC's account here is on thin ice. And so the YouTube version of the show has to be prefaced with this little PSA, only to say that episodes that contain the kinds of themes that have been regularly banned on YouTube will not appear here. And even with that precaution, there's already enough in the archive to get us removed, so remember that the higher side chats could be banned or put in timeout again at any time. And I won't be able to tell you guys about it. So if you feel like it's been too long since you've heard from me here on this digital, dystopian, draconian, data mining monster of a police state seeking platform, your first step should be to check the HigherSideChats.com for the latest shows. All right? All right. Enjoy. Embrace yourself, because you're about to dive into another free first hour episode of the Higher Side Chats. And we just want to let you know that whether you're looking for a companion through your paranoid insomnia, entertaining yourself through one of life's mundane activities, or trying to ward off the internal screams of all those sad, smothered souls around the office, THC is here. And you should know that every episode of the Higher Side Chats has an entire second hour for Plus members. Sign up at thehiresidechats.com and you'll get years of Plus show archives, lifetime forum access, a special invite to Greg Carlwood's monthly joint sessions, MP3s of THC music, bonus episodes, tour videos, and 10% off t-shirts, grinders, and whatever else ends up in the Higher Side store. It's $8 a month that you won't miss, so become a Plus member and treat yourself in these troubled times. Always action-packed and commercial-free, which means you'll unfortunately never hear my voice again. In the 1930s, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt addressed the nation through a series of radio broadcasts known as the Fireside Chats. His aim was to reassure the common man that our society would recover from its troubled times. Well, we're far from 1930, and I deal with a different kind of fire. For a new era of worldly frustration, we offer a fresh conversation. I'm Greg Carlwood, and these are the Higher Side Chats. Here we go, Higher Side Chatters. How the hell are you? From sunny San Diego, I'm Greg Carlwood, trying to bring relief to a world on fire, one pail of podcasting water at a time. And while we've all heard the old quote that we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we use to create them, I wish we were better at keeping it in mind. So often we find ourselves retreading the same intellectual ground from medical science to political strategy, and then one wonders why we have this heavy sense of stuckness. The same problems and patterns resurface, but we rarely seem to graduate from them. And often it's because we've yet to truly go back to the fundamentals and approach topics with fresh eyes and a new way of thinking. Well, it's as true for Bigfoot as it is for fiat currency. And luckily, our guests today are excellent researchers of at least one of those things. And for me, it is time we evolve our thinking on Bigfoot, no pun intended, and while some might wonder why a Bigfoot show is the offering on the table, given everything 2020 has thrown at us, I would argue that most of us have dug in firmly on our opinions at this point, so what more do we need to know? And if our mental attention is currency, let's not make the rich any richer. Besides, our good friend and podcast world ally, Joshua Cutchin, has a new book out, and so we do what we do and talk about it. It's called Where the Footprints End, High Strangeness, and the Bigfoot Phenomenon, Volume 1, Folklore. And today, Josh is joined by his co-author for this latest book, fellow podcaster and paranormal enthusiast, Timothy Renner. Tim also did the illustrations for Where the Footprints End and has written several books of his own, including Beyond the Seventh Gate, Bigfoot in Pennsylvania, Bigfoot West Coast Wild Men, and Don't Look Behind You. His podcast is called Strange Familiars, and it's great to have him here as well. Let's dive into it. The proverbial one-two punch of paranormal podcast guests, the cryptozoology course correctors, making Bigfoot weird again. Josh and Tim, welcome to the higher side. Thanks Absolute for pleasure. Always a highlight whenever I release a book to catch up. Kind of you to say. It is really great to have you back. Obviously, I love your other books. We've had some great conversations about them in previous shows. And Tim, it is a pleasure to have you here as well. 
And so that intro was trying to make the point that in a lot of these areas, the cultural conversation tends to go in circles because with certain things like the paranormal, psi effects, consciousness, and of course, cryptozoology, humans tend to try and twist the subject until it halfway fits into their worldview rather than adapting their worldview and paradigm to fit new information. And it seems like that was the major theme here, kind of the catalyst for writing this book. Let's take the weirdest, craziest Bigfoot accounts and try to examine this mystery from that wider perspective rather than selectively editing down the cases until they fit what we want Bigfoot to be. Would you say that was kind of the inspiration here, fellas? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, it was taking a kind of a holistic look at the phenomenon. And, you know, when I got into it, it was in my mind, and I think in many people's minds, Bigfoot is some undiscovered animal. And that's the approach I took when I got into it, mostly. I mean, I was aware from the start that there was weird stuff associated with Bigfoot sightings, UFOs and strange lights and so forth. But the line that I was given by your sort of flesh and blood cryptozoologist was that the weird stuff with Bigfoot, it rarely ever happens. It's, it's really a rarity that this stuff happens. And then when you start to scratch at it a little bit, you find very quickly that it's not a rarity at all. This weird stuff pops up around Bigfoot constantly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And Josh, what do you think? What would you say is the elevator pitch or the mission statement you had going into this thing? I actually was not at all looking into writing another book when Tim approached me about this. But when he made the pitch, I was like, okay, because I just had twins or I was getting ready to have twins here. And I just knew that I wouldn't have enough time. So I cranked it out. And I think I have a very dear friend named Greg Bishop who hates for me to use this as a point of comparison because of how great Jacques Vallée is. But I think sort of the best way to sort of give people an idea of how this book sits vis-a-vis -vis the Bigfoot phenomena is to compare it to Jacques Vallée's Passport to Magonia and the sort of position that Passport to Magonia occupies in the UFO discourse. It's finally looking at folklore through an unironic lens and saying, well, how does this resonate with a lot of these modern day sightings? So that's not really a comparison in terms of quality to Vallée because, I mean, heaven knows he's such an eloquent writer and an excellent thinker. But in terms of the goal of this book has, I think is really in sort of trying to reframe some of these Bigfoot phenomena in other disciplines that we normally would not consider because, you know, so much of the community is really obsessed with the idea that Bigfoot is a flesh and blood hominid. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, a worthy goal, a passport to Magonia moment for Bigfoot, as it were, definitely a worthy goal. And I guess I would ask you guys what you think it is that has kept this moment from happening sooner. Is it just humans getting in our own way again? I mean, how does this kind of stuff affect the cryptozoology community in particular, same as the ufology community. I'd assume there's a lot of parallels, but why hasn't this community caught up? I think that there is such an earnest desire to be acknowledged by the scientific community that it becomes more prudent to throw out these high strange outliers than it is to actually try to engage with them. I mean, Bigfoot is a hard enough sell as a giant undiscovered monkey. And, you know, UFOs are a hard enough sell as being <laughs> spacecraft from other planets. You know, you can only compound the difficulty of trying to get people to engage with these topics by saying, yeah, and they also disappear. <laughs> and, <laughs> or, you know, there's a lot of stuff in the UFO contact experience that looks like spirit contact. People really start to roll their eyes. And I really think it's from this real desire to sit at, quote unquote, the big kids table of science. I think that really is what motivates a lot of people. But, you know, for me, and I think I speak for Tim in this regard, too. It really is disingenuous to say, we need to believe witnesses and then toss out, oh, well, the witness also said that the Bigfoot was holding a glowing orb or something mm -hmm. along those lines. If you believe witnesses, you believe witnesses, full stop. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And Tim, I know you're out in Pennsylvania and you've written about weird stuff in that area before. This book relays a pretty wild Bigfoot sighting in the intro that pretty much checks off most of the weird boxes. and sort of acts as the quintessential weird Bigfoot experience. Can you talk to us about this case a bit for people who have maybe been tainted by that selective editing process? Researchers have been serving them up in the past and 
maybe aren't aware of how much context has been left out when we think about Bigfoot traditionally. Yeah, well, this was when Josh and I started writing the book, we had plenty of meetings back and forth, but I think pretty early on we agreed if there's one case that's sort of the best representation of the kind of stuff we're talking about, it's this case from Fayette County, Pennsylvania in 1973. And the case begins with a UFO sighting, a bunch of different witnesses. I think it's something like 10 different witnesses or something see a red or orange, depending on who you ask, globe in the sky. And this descended into the farm field of the main witnesses at Parents Farm, I believe. And he proceeded to get in his truck with some two neighbor boys, and they went up to see what happened when this thing appeared to land. Now, when they see it on the ground, it's no longer red or orange. They describe it as a white kind of dome-like shape that's either landed on the ground or hovering just above it. And they're observing this, whatever it is, I hesitate to say craft, but this domed object that's glowing in the field. And one of the kids points out to the main witness, Kowalczyk, that there are two creatures coming towards them. And they observe these two Bigfoot creatures that are walking along a fence line. Their eyes are glowing, I think, green. I deal with so many different color glowing eyes in the Bigfoot. <laughs> um, I sometimes forget which case has which color. And they're making these strange kind of bellowing utterances and sounds like a crying baby, I believe. And there's a smell associated with them that they said sounded like, I believe it was a burning rather it smelled like burning tar or something some kind of bad yeah burning rubber i think yeah and he proceeded to shoot them with no reaction at least the first time he shot them he shot a tracer above their head or alongside their head and then one creature he said it reached out as if it was trying to grab the tracer and then he actually shot the creature when they considered to proceed to him he said he was sure he hit it but he said it sounded like it was firing into a pond so it has this kind of watery sound that he fired into it. Otherwise, it didn't react. They got out of there, called the police. The police called an investigator named Stan Gordon, who is still investigating today, a wonderful investigator from Pennsylvania. And during this time in 1973 and 74, they were having a really big flap of UFO and Bigfoot sightings all across Pennsylvania. And Stan was the main investigator. He'd given his name to the police. So when the police got these strange calls or cases, phone into them, they'd often call Stan. I think this all happened about 10 at night, and Stan and his investigation team were out there by 1 in the morning. The witness had proceeded back to the location with a police officer. When he fired into the creature, I think he said it bellowed, and that dome-like shape disappeared. He said it didn't fly away, didn't take off into the sky, it just blinked out and disappeared. When the policeman went back with the witness, there was a ring glowing on the ground where this object had been hovering or where it was landed that was bright enough to read a newspaper by, the policeman said. So it's very, very bright, still uh, glowing there. They saw the creatures again. Kowalczyk fired again. This time the creature did react and kind of charged towards them, but they beat it out of there. So Stan Gordon's on the scene by 1 a.m. the following morning. They go back to the location with the witness. The witness has this event happen where he starts howling and roaring and sort of making these inhuman sounds, and he's running around like a madman around the field. And his own father said he thought that his son had been possessed by one of the Bigfoot creatures, the way he was acting. Hmm. He eventually passes out. They help him from the field. He comes to, and one of the most interesting things is he comes to, and they hand him his glasses, and he says, I don't need those. Like He doesn't recognize his own glasses and says he doesn't need them. But when he was out in this sort of altered state or this fugue state or whatever he was in, he had a UFO contactee-like vision of a Grim Reaper-type figure coming to him and telling him, you know, the world's going to end unless mankind straightens out. And there's a kind of thing you've heard from UFO contactees again and again. His whole life is completely changed by this. He was not a believer in anything unusual or paranormal before this. And after this, he experiences different psi effects and has these predictions of the future that come to him that seem to be coming true. And a few weeks after the event, he's visited by these two figures. One of them is dressed like an Air Force officer. Another's in a suit. And 
they either outright claim or at least suggest that they are there on behest of Stan Gordon. They show the witness some pictures. He said they showed him pictures of Bigfoot creatures and of UFOs. And they asked him if he would be willing to be hypnotized. They hypnotize him and years go by. Some years later, Stan Gordon gets the idea that I want to hypnotize this witness and see if we can get any more information from him and ask him if he would submit to hypnosis. And he says, well, you already hypnotized me and tells Stan the story of these two strange figures, these men in black like figures that kind of come and hypnotize him a few weeks after the event. So layers and layers and layers of strangeness all <laughs> rolled into the single case. It's absolutely fantastic example of the kind of things we're talking about as regards Sasquatch. Yeah, what I can't understand is why all that happened around this giant monkey. It just doesn't make any sense, does it? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. And I'm glad you opened the book with that and could tell the story here. There's so many weird details. Not only does he not need his glasses, he doesn't recognize them. And the most interesting thing to me is those after effects. And I'm glad you highlighted those as well. I wonder how big the hole in the research is when it comes to following up on experiencers later to see if they did have prophetic dreams or a possession spell or an MIB visit. We don't typically think of it that way because, oh, you had a weird sighting of an animal. But no, if this is a paranormal cover for something strange, because if we're going to the Jacques Vallée thing, he talked about a lot of UFO things as a projection of some sorts. So if this is just another skin for some projection, then you would expect it to have the same effects later because it really affects people's consciousness in weird ways. And I guess I would ask, how big do you think that hole is? Do you think there's a lot of after effects in this field of research that have probably been missed that need to be reopened? I think that there are a lot of peripheral things that happen to a lot of these Bigfoot witnesses, especially habituators, people who have longitudinal experiences with Bigfoot on or around their property. I think that there's a lot of peripheral phenomena that get underreported. We're only sort of now starting to see the UFO community opening up about the high strangeness that surrounds all these UFO sightings. Now they're willing to talk about, oh yeah, after my experience, I had poltergeist activity in my house, or I had these profound synchronicities, stuff that doesn't really fit with the extraterrestrial hypothesis. And I think that the Bigfoot community is coming out a little bit more in favor of discussing those things. I'm reminded of my good friend, Mike Cleland, who long time ago said that, you know, a lot of nuts and bolts UFO researchers won't talk about the weird stuff until you get them, you know, to the bar after the conference and then get a couple of drinks in them. And then you start to hear these weird stories, these stories that just seem like they're more super normal or supernatural than they are, you know, extraterrestrial. And the similar thing is happening in the Bigfoot community, from what I understand. And I think that there was at one point, and there probably is still with these larger Bigfoot research organizations, an effort to deliberately suppress a lot of these strange aspects. But I think that, and Tim, feel free to confirm or deny this in your opinion, but I think that the community is becoming much more open about discussing these strange aspects. I don't know if this book could have been written 10 or 15 years ago. It should have been written 10 or 15 years ago, but you're <laughs> it right. should, I don't know yeah. if it could have been. Yeah, it seems like we're having a moment for weird Bigfoot. And, you know, I wonder if it's just not 60, 70 years of casting footprints and ignoring the weird stuff, kind of leading to not many answers. And people are just kind of breaking and saying, well, We've ignored the weird stuff long enough. Now we have to dig in. I'm not sure. Mm. And Josh, you mentioned Mike Clellan. And yes, he has a great book called The Messengers, all about owls in this whole paranormal space. I had him on here, got to be a couple of years ago at this point. But another good point that comes up in your book that maybe even complicates things further is that there very well could be a wild man lineage or maybe just an archetype out there. But using the analogy that Mike uses in his work, owls are real, but sometimes owl imagery is also used by something else that's behind this weird stuff. And there could be a parallel there that maybe almost both are true in a sense. Yeah. I mean, I think you kind of have to at least entertain that idea because as much as we're talking about the weirdness that surrounds a lot of these Bigfoot sightings, 
there are aspects of these Bigfoot sightings that are 100% out of any primate textbook. You'll see things like dermal ridges on you know, the footprints and mid-tarsal breaks, it's things that are very specific to primate anatomy. You'll find reports of people stumbling upon Bigfoot and the Bigfoot's hair standing on end, which is a common threat display. It's called pillow erection, the common threat display amongst higher primates. So obviously, there's got to be some sort of interplay with the natural world in this respect. I think I'm probably a little bit more charitable of the idea of a flesh and blood Bigfoot than Tim is at this point, even though I think I think I started out a little bit weird and then Tim wasn't as weird and then somehow we passed each other in the night so that now I'm <laughs> yeah. so somehow I'm kind of the one who's always willing to like leave a foot in the door for the flesh and blood primate. Because let's be honest, we don't really have an idea of what is going on. I think the most yeah, the most charitable thing that you can say is that if this is literally a undiscovered or a relict population of hominid, it has some strange attributes that we are just not prepared to discuss in terms of our current materials paradigm. Mm -hmm. King of evolution, if that's the case. <laughs> yes. And on so many topics, I find myself drifting back and forth as well, because you want to come to one conclusion and then you hear a story that blows that conclusion up and say, so like, well, okay, maybe I'll go back over here. But there's just so much weird data out there. Of course, when we grew up seeing the Patterson footage and watching Harry and the Hendersons, it's definitely going to have an effect on us thinking this is a flesh and blood creature. So, yeah, I understand why that would keep coming around in your, uh, your mindset about how to look at this thing. But, man, there's definitely just too much other weird stuff that can't be denied. Yeah, we, we have to accept the possibility that there might be multiple scenarios at play, but just throwing out the strange stuff doesn't really do anybody any favors. Sorry, Tim, you were about to say something? Well, I was going to say the other thing that, that I was kind of told as I was getting into this and kind of poking at the weird stuff was that East Coast Bigfoot cases are weird and West Coast Bigfoot cases are natural animals. And the further east you go, the weirder the cases get until you get to you know Pennsylvania, which is like king of the weird Bigfoot stuff. But it's really not true. There's weird Bigfoot stuff all over, including plenty of weird Bigfoot stuff from the Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to high strangeness that accompanies these sightings, you relay a lot of different sighting stories. Obviously, they can be wildly different, their own special snowflakes and all that. But what are the major themes on the checklist? Obviously, that first story hit on several of them, orbs of light, a possession aspect, an MIB-like visit in the aftermath. But what other themes seem to come up more and more as you've dug into this thing? Well, one of the things that has consistently stuck in my crawl for a while is the similarities between poltergeist infestations and Bigfoot Class B reports. So if anybody isn't Aware of this term, the Class B report is, is a term that the Bigfoot Field Research Organization has used to catalog things that happen in the forest that are odd and highly suggestive of Sasquatch, but no Sasquatch is actually seen. And these can include rock throwing, noises, wood knocks, footprints, etc. But if you take all those different things that people attribute to Sasquatch when they're in the woods and put them in a house centered around, you know, for example, a prepubescent girl, you've got a poltergeist <laughs> to the extent that to the extent that, you know, sometimes these rocks that are thrown at people in the woods are warm to the touch. Now, if you're, you know, of the more primatological way of thinking, you say, oh, well, the Bigfoot was holding a rock in its hand and that's why the rock's warm and then it throws it at the person. But it's interesting that without fail, these rains and showers of stones that happen during poltergeist infestations are often hot or you know, warm to the touch as well. And, you know, there's precedence for all these other things. These knocks and raps are one of the most common manifestations of poltergeist activity, particularly in seances that you used to find during the spiritualist tradition. And yeah, believe it or not, plenty of seances where people saw manifestations of large hairy hands or in some extreme examples, large man creatures or man things covered in fur. So there's this poltergeist as aspect, which kind of I think is interesting because it's sort of threads its way through several of the different topics. A lot of different paranormal entities have been attributed with this, you know, the stone throwing, the lithoboldy, as it's called, behavior, including fairies. And there's an entire chapter dedicated to fairies. The extraterrestrial connection, which is something I would have never put together. Ghosts. And then 
Tim's real areas of focus are sort of on window areas and gifting and this whole woman in white archetype, which is something that really blew me away the first time I, I noticed it. But there are definitely these things that find their way through all these different topics, the stone throwing, the knocks, the vocalizations, the ability to phase through matter or to blink out of existence and disappear. All these things occur in each of these different subjects. Interestingly enough, another topic, you know, why we haven't ever killed a Bigfoot is because in almost every account, I say almost every because there's some caveats to be made there, but in almost every account, people shoot at these things and they don't even react. You know, it's not like they're injured or something. They just literally act as if nothing's happening. And you'll find that sort of bulletproof aspect manifesting itself in, you know, old world witch literature where people would like fire a musket ball at a witch's chest and the musket ball would be destroyed or somebody would try to cut a witch's hair with some scissors and the scissors would become completely mangled and ruined. So this idea that these creatures are impervious, they just don't seem to have this real physical component. It's something that comes up time and time again in all this, all this literature. Yes, I think that's a great breakdown. And I think it's wildness, guys, as you put it, but that's a really great connection to make because people have been looking at this stuff for so long, but they haven't really realized that the biggest difference between poltergeist themes and Bigfoot themes is that you're either inside or outside because, like you say, the rapping sounds, the throwing of rocks around, happening mainly after nightfall, like those are pretty big similarities and probably shouldn't be discounted. And another good example is one that Tim is going to be diving into quite a bit in volume two, which is already laid out. We've just got to, <laughs> we just got to put it together now. Are these balls of light? You know, you see a ball of light in the sky. It's a UFO. You see a ball of light dancing across the countryside in Ireland. It's a fairy. You see a ball of light inside an old house and it's a ghost from a haunted house. And you see a ball of light in the woods. And believe it or not, there's actually a lot of connections between Bigfoot and these mysterious orbs of light. So I've often thought that it's kind of attractive to approach these ideas as sort of a pan paranormal possibility that there might be one phenomena behind all these things. And I'm not sure. I like to leave some room for myself to be wrong on that. But I think at the very least, there is significant overlap in the Venn diagrams of each of these different topics. Mm -hmm. I think that's why I'm attracted to the idea of window areas, because if you could say it's a window to the imaginative realm or the imaginal or something that, uh, you know, probably fits in Patrick Harper's book. <laughs> it's like that makes a lot of this other stuff make sense because why wouldn't many things fall out of the imaginal realm and into this one? I don't know. That's kind of why I'm attracted to that idea because everything is so varied. Well, one of the reasons that I think that this collaboration between Timothy and I works so well is that I'm mostly the guy looking for old, you know, dusty books and, you know, ancient archive.org pages of, you know, finding all these old books and making those interdisciplinary connections. But Tim actually has a great amount of fieldwork under his belt. And I'm super jealous because he happens to live in what I would, I don't know if he would, but I would call his little slice of America sort of a window area in and of itself. Hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm lucky to live where I live and be interested in this kind of stuff for sure. <laughs> well, that was going to be one of my questions for you. And our listeners would be extra interested because you are in Pennsylvania. You talk about York County, which borders the Susquehanna River. And we have a semi-regular guest who talks about the magical potency and the synchronicity potency of the Susquehanna River and the long legacy it has of people performing rituals and offerings to the river goddess and so that sort of thing fitting within a, a, a paranormal hotspot we could say is very appropriate i think that makes a lot of sense but i guess i would ask you what has your field research and just living in that area what kind of insights has that given you that maybe someone who doesn't have field research would have like what did you learn from getting out of the books and into the real environment i mean a lot you talk about a window area that the chapter i have in the book called the company they keep is about an area of eight to ten square miles in york county right along the river right along the susquehanna there where i started looking at bigfoot reports you know i tracked an old report from a paper back in you know the 1880s and then i noticed how many reports I was getting from this area and I tracked these reports through the years and I was like, wow, that's a lot of Bigfoot reports for this area. So 
I started, you know, really looking at the area and digging in and, you know, two things became apparent. First of all, there's no wilderness there in which a breeding population of giant ape men could live and hide. You know, there's some woods there, some beautiful hiking trails, but, you know, a breeding population of giant ape creatures, like there's just, there's nothing there for it. There's no place for them to hide. There's probably enough food, I guess, although the environmental impact would be pretty evident, I think, if there was, a again, a breeding population of giant ape creatures there, but there's definitely no place for them to hide. So I'm left with these questions like, well, what's going on? Like, are they coming through? You know, are they nomadic? A lot of the flesh and blood research, well, they're nomadic. Well, I'm getting reports from all times of year. So that doesn't make sense for a nomadic creature. Like, why are they there in the winter and the summer? And then I started noticing all of this other weirdness. As I'm looking at Bigfoot cases, and I'm asking around in the area and people are like, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, my cousin saw Bigfoot here in you know 1975 or whatever. But this house is haunted. I'm like, oh, okay. And there's a ghost story here. And there were spiritualists that lived in this house and they would do automatic writing. And they said pirates sailed up the Susquehanna and buried treasure in the area. And there's UFO sightings. And again, it's all this stuff in this eight square mile area. And I just started thinking there's a lot of weird stuff here for it not to be connected. And at some point I was just casually, this is long before we ever started working on the book. I was just casually talking to Josh about it. And he said, you know, very offhandedly to me. He said, Tim, look at the company these things keep. And, you know, gave me the title for that chapter. But it's a lot of wisdom to it. And I started just thinking about it. Like, wow, this is, you know, how rare is it to see a Bigfoot? How rare is it to see a UFO? And now we're talking about multiple instances of people seeing both in this, you know, eight to 10 square mile area. There's also a nuclear power plant dropped in there. There's all kinds of just strange, strange stuff there. So that was a major factor for me kind of backing away from that flesh and blood hypothesis and getting into more of this weird idea. So between that and also talking to witnesses on a regular basis and, you know, Josh touched on this. I think it's important to point out that, you know, if a hunter sees a creature walk by when he's in a tree stand or if, you know, somebody's driving down the road and a Bigfoot crosses in front of them, I don't blame those people at all for thinking they're natural creatures. All the information they got at the moment they saw it was that there's a natural creature that walked across in front of my vision and walked into the woods or whatever happened. But it's these people that have these repeat encounters. And without fail, when I start asking them, what else happens? What else happens? What else happens? Well, there's weird lights. We saw orbs. There's this, there's this happens. There's poltergeist activity at my house. It's really just a checklist you can go through. So it's very, very valuable to have that boots on the ground experience, I think, when you talk to these people and they just start opening up and and telling, once they know it's safe, once they know you don't think they're crazy for seeing a Bigfoot, they'll open up and tell you about the other stuff. And again, I can't think of an instance where people have had repeat encounters that I've talked to them that they haven't also experienced other weird stuff with Bigfoot. Right on. Yes. Repeat experiencers. Another commonality with other slices of the paranormal pie, for sure. And it wouldn't make sense in the context of a flesh and blood creature, you know, you could say there's a lot of areas where bears or mountain lions are rare, but if, you know, one family is seeing a mountain lion every week, then something's definitely up. (laughs) And Josh, you have a great story that kicks off your section on the fairy folk L'Oreal overlap, we could say, because it has my favorite magic words, subterranean lair. And this comes (laughs) from uh, June 9th, 1857, edition of Salem's Weekly Oregon Statesman. Really going into the archives for that one, but can you tell us a little bit about this particular case? Actually, this was brought to my attention by Tim, and I've since found it in another book on large hairy giants where they really weird washed (laughs) everything out of it, all the strange aspects. But there was a young boy who was overnighting in the forest with an adult, and he heard this long, sort of loud, plaintive cry in the forest. And this hairy man-beast, about 13 or so feet high, steps out. And he says it had eyes that glowed like liquid balls of fire. And this hairy man-thing, which obviously, you know, given that it's Oregon and it's tall and a hairy man-thing, you have to say a Sasquatch, appears to this boy and grabs him. 
and takes him through a trap door to this underground lair that was indirectly illuminated and the ceiling was domed and appeared to be covered with almost like seashell type textures of every shape and color. And, you know, deeper in the cave, he heard this sort of unearthly music echoing out of the tunnels. So this wild man leaves the boy there and eventually returns, but he returns with this beautiful young lady who takes this, basically a business card, this card that's embossed with the words that said, boy, depart hence forthwith or remain and be devoured. And so the boy ended up exacting his escape. Now, this is striking because it sounds almost identical to a lot of the fairy lore that you'll find in the British Isles. Oftentimes, people would either stumble into or be abducted to fairyland. And while there, someone that they knew, typically a deceased friend, relative, or neighbor, would come up to them and tell them, you've got to get out of here. Don't eat the food or else you'll be stuck here. Their goal is to keep you here forever. So motivically, that lines up perfectly. You've got this sort of unearthly music floating through the air, and fairies love to make music, and oftentimes unearthly music that didn't seem to have a source would be attributed to the faithful. And also, I think that the description of this underground cave as being illuminated from some non-existent light source and being beautiful and domed has a lot of precedent, not only in the alien abduction literature, where you often find this illumination from no obvious place in this sort of domed circular area, but also a lot of descriptions of the space that you emerge into on DMT trips. This sort of very elaborate, almost like a domed, I want to say like a mosaic sort of ceiling. Yeah, like a magic eye poster. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you put all these things together and then you throw Bigfoot on top and you're like, what are we looking at here? Now, I'm sure that a lot of people will push back and say, well, fairies were always small. And, and while there's some degree of truth to that, fairies were also shapeshifters. And there are plenty of stories of taller entities that fall under that fairy umbrella, like trolls and ogres and whatnot. Really interesting that a lot of the British folklore describes brownies and their ilk. So brownies, goblins, Pekemderlin, a lot of these different sort of small classes of fairies were described as being little short, hairy men with these monkey faces. So again, there's a nice little Bigfoot connection there as well. And that rabbit hole just keeps getting deeper and deeper the more you peel away from it, you know, to the extent that some people said you could summon fairies by knocking three times on a tree. And what do we see time and again in Bigfoot reports, but are these wood knocks that people say are either Bigfoot knocking rocks together or Bigfoot knocking a, a limb on a tree to present these sort of knocks in the forest. So just it's a rich vein of inquiry that I don't think a lot of people have really taken the time to look into. Yes, same shape for sure. And obviously, Josh and I have talked about this underground stuff before, but what are your thoughts on the subterranean aspect of this stuff, Tim? I mean, again, from field research, one of the questions I ask people when I go out on any paranormal investigation is, what's buried in the ground here that's special? Ah. Are there stories of buried treasure? Is there old mines? and a lot of the time, I can't put a number on it. I'd say 75% probably or more. You get these stories that people say, oh, yeah, there's a story of buried treasure or, yeah, there's a lost silver mine here that, you know, there's a legend in the neighborhood that there was a silver mine that people had dug here and, you know, it's not here. Even sometimes it comes to the idea that the creatures themselves are living in the ground. So it's this idea that there's something special, something in the ground that is special or valuable. And I find it again and again, a lot of the places I investigate, you know, they've been digging into the ground for hundreds of years, their old mines and so forth. So I think there's something to it. There's really something to it. The idea of, you know, again, it's something, it's not always gold that's buried in the ground, but it's the idea of something special, something valuable being in the ground. Yes. And again, that's a common folkloric trope, not only the monster or the dragon guarding buried treasure, but also fairies and ghosts, which have multiple points of correlation with these Bigfoot sightings, would often be found lurking around these sites of buried treasure. I was astonished to find not only this correlation, which is another... <laughs> so every now and then, every now and then, Tim comes to me with this thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, Bigfoot and buried treasure. There's a connection there. I'm like, what are you talking <laughs> about? And then I look into it. I'm like, oh, yeah, Tim, you're exactly right. So while not explicitly buried treasure, the idea of like mine shafts and whatnot. And I was surprised to find that that is not only consistent in several cases that we have in the book, but also the most famous of you know North American treasures, Oak Island, also has basically a Bigfoot that appeared during 
what sounds like a sleep paralysis incident to one of the night watchmen and said, you know, you've got to leave <laughs> this Bigfoot sitting on his chest. And it's like, that's just strange. Sleep paralysis and buried treasure and this large hairy man thing appearing all in the same spot. It's just wild. <laughs> it is. It is. And didn't that guy say it was the only thing that ever scared him? He descended into alcoholism and eventually killed himself. Yeah. So he was originally a treasure hunter himself and he had an associate of his die after hitting a pocket of gas while looking for the Oak Island treasure. And he was kept on as a night watchman. And one night, around 11 or 12 o'clock, he had this fire going and he woke up and he couldn't breathe. And there were these two giant red eyes staring in his face. And the red eyes were attached to this curly haired, covered entity that said, you know, don't ever come back. It smiled at him and it just, you know, blinked out of sight. And after that, he did have some serious problems with. You know, anxiety and depression and alcoholism, which ties into another thing that you see that a lot of flesh and blood cryptozoologists like to sort of poo-poo is this idea that there might be some sort of Bigfoot curse that seeing or interacting with Bigfoot might manifest. And it's something of a trope that you have to sort of broaden your your interpretation of what a curse might be. And then you start to it starts to come into focus a little bit better. You know, a lot of people say, oh, well, people see Sasquatch all the time and don't die. Well, yes, but people also see Sasquatch all the time and their lives are forever changed. You have people who have <laughs> tens of thousands of dollars of hunting equipment never wanting to go back into the forest. I think they would consider that a curse. In addition to stuff like alcoholism, which is a very common thing, people, you know, not knowing how to cope with their world being overturned by seeing these things. And again, you find this in fairy folklore as well. The idea that you actually wouldn't even call them fairies. You'd call them the good people or the wee folk or something. You find a precedent for that as well in certain tribes and, for example, Alaska, who don't necessarily refer to their Bigfoot analogs by name either. They use euphemisms for their Bigfoot as well because they're afraid of, you know, invoking their wrath. So, you know, motivically, these things just keep on lining up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great points. And Tim, I think you're right to ask what's in the ground around here. I think that's an awesome first question when you're investigating stuff. And there is so much unknown history, especially here in the States. I mean, we've got probably mass graves we don't know about. There's magic mounds that we've dismissed as nothing. And of course, that's another aspect of the unknown history is our attitudes towards the Native people who were here. That's definitely colored this research. And you have some Native American stories in the book that are great that you could imagine 100 years ago were probably not taken with the same weight that we would read them today. So there's all kinds of stuff that is going to make it hard to solve this problem or solve this puzzle when we just don't even know so many aspects of the history, which might play a real role in what the hell's going on. Yeah, absolutely. Josh dug into the Native American folklore a little bit more than I did. Our problem with that, I think, when approaching this book, well, it's probably multifold or manifold rather, but part of it was people tend to treat Native American culture monolithically. You know, Native Americans believe this and they'll, they'll give you a blanket. For me, more than that, it was the tendency for flesh and blood Bigfoot researchers to just use the names, to just pick out these Native names they had for whatever their wild man was, the, you know, the big hairy thing that lived in the forest next to them, whether it was Oma or Sasquatch or any number of these, you know, native names. And they love to do that because look, Native Americans were talking about these creatures before we ever got here and they had a name for them. But they completely edit out anything when these same Native Americans would say, yeah, but these creatures come from another world or they have magic powers or yes, they're another type of Indian a big hairy Indian, but they also have these special abilities that they can do this, this, and this. So these aspects are just not talked about. Again, it's this selective editing to use anything that makes it seem like a natural creature and take out anything else. And it's a real failing, I think, of looking back at any historical culture, whether it be Native American or through European folklore, and say, well, they knew what they were talking about when they were talking about, you know, a natural creature like a wolf. But when they saw this wild man and they said it, you know, it just disappeared. Well, they didn't know what they were looking at. They were dumb back then. They were naive, primitive people. So I, I think that's a real failing of looking at this stuff through any traditional culture. 
Well put, Tim. I'm very hesitant to trot out the word racism for everything, like it feels like it is sometimes, but there is a racist component, I think, in the way that a lot of cryptozoologists treat these stories of Bigfoot, similarly to the way that people treat the ancient cultures and the ancient aliens sort of sphere. They automatically assume that, you know, these people who have this better understanding of the natural world than we do, quite honestly, couldn't make the cut between the real world and the supernatural world. The idea that, oh, they must have been misinterpreting it. You know, they're, <laughs> they've been able to, you know, machine these stone blocks to such precision. But when they said that this was supernatural, no, they must have been talking about spacemen. Or maybe it was just supernatural. <laughs> you know, so similarly with, you know, Native American cultures. And I did my best when writing this to really specifically call tribes by their specific names to identify their beliefs as accurately as I could. There's a similar problem where you say, well, yeah, they knew that this deer wasn't, you know, magically phasing in out of dimensions, but they said that Bigfoot was, but they just didn't realize how stealthy Bigfoot was. Bigfoot's a forest ninja. It's like, or they're telling you exactly what was going on, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's so true. Good points, guys. And there is an account in the book that I did want to highlight for a couple of reasons. One, it does touch on the fact that many Native American tribes seemed to have found a better context for Bigfoot than we even have today. And it's in a cave. And it also comes from the late, great Brad Steger. You know, pour one out in his honor. Brad was the man. But an 1888 diary shared with Brad has an entry where the diarist observed a tribesman in California taking plates of raw meat into a cave for an enormous, docile, hairy beast the tribesman called Crazy Bear. He said it arrived on Earth when a, quote, small moon piloted by humans descended from the stars. It's like, wow, uh, that's something I wish we could ask a few follow-up questions on, right? Yeah, absolutely. But at the same time, you know, it's one of those stories, you find similar stories throughout many different tribes describing these as being, I mean, for lack of a better term, you know, extraterrestrial pets, or what we would probably call extraterrestrial pets. You know, it's no, no real surprise to anybody who's listened to my previous interviews on THC that I am not especially affectionate towards the extraterrestrial hypothesis. So I still think that this is probably describing in my mind, at least where I am right now, some degree of spirit phenomena. But you can't ignore the fact that a small moon piloted by people from the stars sounds a lot like a spacecraft. But you'll find that, you know, these different craft described in these different tribes as like these large white birds or these large lights that leave these giant hairy things behind. Does that mean that, you know, Bigfoot is an extraterrestrial scout? I don't know, but there are plenty of overlaps with Sasquatch sightings and what we would call the alien abduction experience. Some that I had really no idea were as prevalent as they are until I really got into it. But things like livestock mutilation, something that just blew my mind was the number of times that people have missing time in conjunction with their Bigfoot sightings. You know, there was a famous podcaster, the host of Sasquatch Chronicles, when he first had his sighting. With his brother, they were convinced that the entire thing should have maybe, at max, taken about 40 minutes. And then they got down the mountain and they found out that three hours had elapsed, which is pretty chilling, but completely consistent with the alien abduction experience. And before that, these visitors to Fairyland who thought that they were you know, dancing for three minutes inside a fairy circle and it had actually been three days. You find these stories of Bigfoot missing time actually are not as uncommon as one would assume. Some people try to explain this away by saying, oh, well, when you're under, you know, tense situations, time seems to speed up. But literally, laboratory experiments on time perception show that the exact opposite is true. Stress actually tends to slow down one's perception of time. Anybody who's been in a car accident can attest to that fact. Hmm. Yes. Well, man, the alien pet hypothesis might be my new favorite. And, you know, if we were engineered as a slave species, as some people say, well, these aliens might have kept some around to run the ships or the program could also still be going on. Or, or you know, maybe when this maybe when space Bigfoot go feral, they lose all their hair and they become human beings. You know? <laughs> Who knows? Right. A lot of possibilities. And so here's a question for each of you. But this book is largely about taking this Bigfoot research conversation forward and bucking the same old Bigfoot 101 stuff. What would you guys consider to be the most cutting edge thoughts and ideas on the Bigfoot phenomenon? Hmm. Oh, boy. 
Josh? <laughs> Outside of the alien pet hypothesis, of course. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's so much going on with this. You know, from, from the idea of interdimensional stuff to people like Ron Moorhead, who I like a great deal, and he's done some fantastic work, but his attempts to use quantum physics to explain how Bigfoot could still be a natural creature and do all these weird things, which again, Ron's done some incredible work, but I just think quantum physics is a little bit deeper, I think, than most people grasp. And with most people's understanding of quantum physics, you might as well say it's magic. Josh had a great quote that he thought I said, which I absolutely did not. Someone said it that if you think you understand quantum physics, you don't understand quantum physics. It's something along those lines. But we remain very agnostic on these different theories because at the end of the day, we don't know. The most exciting stuff for me is probably like what Patrick Harper is doing, the idea of these daemons, as he would call it. For me, it's a little bit more Jungian, I guess, the wild man archetype, the idea that it's just something other that's always been next to us. And that's probably where I'm going in the future of this stuff. The idea that the wild man archetype is very exciting to me. But who knows? Maybe someday we can get some kind of proof that this thing is stepping out of another dimension or aliens are dropping them off and so forth. But that's why, again, Josh and I remain pretty agnostic. No point in this book or in volume two are you going to hear us say, well, Bigfoot comes from another dimension or Bigfoot is an alien or Bigfoot is a ghost. It's just, we're not saying that. We're just pointing out how these things are alike, how Bigfoot does act like a ghost or act like a witch, et cetera. For me, whenever you get people who are unafraid of pushing against materialist explanations, that's the route that I want to go down. Because again, we mentioned Ron Moorhead, who again has done some great work, but in trying to invoke quantum physics, he's still playing the materialist game, which I think that, I mean, you know, <laughs> as somebody who listens to THC, that doesn't cut it anymore, trying to chase that materialist rabbit. So for me, I think that if you look at people who are longitudinal, long-term experiencers, those are the, the people that I find most interesting. For volume two, Tim and I both took an individual and their particular experiences as a case study and sort of like laid out two people who have had basically like the quintessential weird Bigfoot experiences that tie in all sorts of things like, you know, UFOs and portals and the dead and telepathy and all these things. And I think that that's really where, for me, this research should be going. That's the next frontier. Having said that, there's a growing acceptance of using voice box or spirit box or ghost box devices in Bigfoot research. And they're getting some interesting results of that sort of being a way to communicate with something that sometimes says it's Bigfoot. Is it? I don't know. I mean, as Tim pointed out one time, you know, that could be your subconscious saying <laughs> that it's Bigfoot. You could be, you could be the one manifesting that yourself. So yeah, but I think that thinking about these things obliquely and drawing on tools from other disciplines like ghost hunting, I think is probably going to yield more successful results than a lot of people who are tied up in the flesh and blood hypothesis would like to admit. Mm -hmm. I like both those answers. Yeah, maybe it is just being unbiased and open to all possibilities and taking an honest look at the comparison to wider paranormal themes and just not trying to force anything to fit, but being honest about things that do. Yeah, I mean, you know, I used to say maybe they'll roll a body into a lab one day. And my job will become easier. Mm -hmm. But I've adjusted that way of thinking because even if they roll a body in a lab one day, we still have a lot to explain. Why do these weird lights pop up around this thing that you've now rolled a body into a lab? Mm -hmm. I don't have a lot of confidence that that's ever going to happen because as I get into in volume two, there's been many, many people who have claimed to have captured or killed one of these creatures over the years. And without exception, 100% of the time, the bodies are gone. They're missing. They're unavailable to us. Whether it's they're taken back by the creatures, supposedly, you know, and buried or whatever Bigfoot is supposed to do with their dead or a mysterious black van pulls up and takes the body away or, you know, a spaceship comes and levitates the body into a UFO or whatever, whatever the case, however they disappear, it doesn't matter. The bodies are gone. A hundred percent of them are gone. So I don't have any real confidence that we're ever going to have a body. 
at least not for any significant amount of time. I agree with you. I do get the sense that there is something bleeding in from another dimension of some sorts, and sometimes the window can close and something can get stuck here, but I feel like there's an agency of some kind, maybe a paranormal one, that very closely monitors when stuff does get stuck here. Or maybe it dissipates on its own, but we do have these visitations from MIB kind of people that suggest to me that they're very much like, okay, what did you see and where is it? Like, mm -hmm. what, are your, what are your conclusions here? Are you going to be talking about this a lot? You know, that kind of stuff. It seems very heavily managed. The Bigfoot world has a man in black analog in the form of these two fellows that claim to be from either the Department of the Interior or another government organization that tend to show up. It's the same two guys that show up all over the country and have been for years. One is a very large fellow. They describe him as six foot nine or taller. Big biker looking guy in a flannel shirt. And another guy in a suit. They tend to show up and sort of act as the Bigfoot world's men in black. I get into this in volume two. But there's a problem with evidence in general in that our best evidence for Bigfoot, and it's very good. If you look at the footprints, especially with the work like Jeff Meldrum has done, these are really, really good casts of footprints. Some of them, not all of them, but some of them are very, very good. And they show dermal ridges and mid-tarsal breaks and all this anatomy that, you know, Jeff Meldrum, as someone who specializes in like primate locomotion and primate foot anatomy and so forth, he can look at these casts and say like, yes, something alive left this footprint. And here's why. And here's all these great details. That, you know, unless you're an expert on his level, you'd never be able to fake. But in terms of, and I always frame this in terms of saints relics, because it's just easier to understand. So if you have a fingernail or a piece of hair from a saint, that's a primary relic that came from the saint's body. If you have, you know, a piece of the saint's prayer cloth or something the saint touched, that's a secondary relic of a saint. So the best we have for Bigfoot, the best evidence are these casts. And they're all secondary relics. Any kind of primary relic we have from Bigfoot, whether it's hair samples, blood samples, all this DNA evidence, always, always, always is contested. Never is there one case where somebody has a hair that you can get experts to line up on and say, yes, this is a hair from a Bigfoot. You will get experts to line up on both sides. Yes, this is something strange. Oh, no, this is something you know perfectly explainable. Same with the DNA evidence. The DNA tests have been all over the place. The one that Melba Ketchum did was absolutely flawed. If you look at other DNA experts, the test that Brian Sykes did in the UK was problematic as well. If you ask the people who sent the samples and so forth, and a lot of people don't believe his results. Again, it's, it's just this mess of people lining up on both sides, expert and layman saying, you know, this physical evidence is real. No, it's not, et cetera, et cetera. So there's primary relics. There's really nothing that we can agree on. There's hairs out there that people say, yeah, this is a Bigfoot hair. But no, you can't get experts to agree that or at least agree that it, you know, it actually came from a Bigfoot. The best you might get is like, yeah, we don't know what this is. Whatever this is, we don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. But that's a problem with Bigfoot evidence. You know, our best evidence is secondary relics. I like the relics analogy because and I sometimes think that it is similar to the placebo effect where. We have the ability subconsciously probably to do all kinds of stuff, but we need to put it on something else. So, you know, you take a pill and then you're like, oh, that pill healed me when really it was just a sugar pill. Obviously, we all know what the placebo effect is. But similarly, there could be artifacts where it's like, oh, this is the spear that pierced Christ's side. And someone with a lot of religious conviction could touch that. And then all of a sudden have a spontaneous experience, an ecstatic experience, or have a healing happen or something like that. And sometimes these artifacts do turn out to be fraudulent, but yet they still have insane effects. I find that interesting. I think it makes it, I think that's a clue that the consciousness of the individual is a key component here. Absolutely. You know, it's funny, on at least one of our other interviews, some commenters came in and were like, Jungian archetypes, this is silly. And, I'm like, and it, honestly, it's not that we're saying this stuff is made up, but it can also be, you know, generated internally and also be real. You know, similarly, I got some pushback at one of my talks for discussing, you know, a lot of these 
bits of physical evidence and then saying, well, Bigfoot might not be a flesh and blood creature. They're like, well, how does it leave hair and how does it leave blood and scat and footprints? And I said, well, if you look at, you know, the parapsychological literature, I think we can all agree that ghosts are not tangible and physical. Yet, if ghosts do exist, they apparently can interact with the physical world just fine. They can leave behind handprints and writing on walls and slamming doors. Similarly, if you look at psi phenomena, that's entirely internally generated, but can also have an impact on the physical world as well. So I think that people need to sort of, I would encourage people who are interested in these topics to stop thinking about things as this false dichotomy of real or not real or physical or you know non-physical. And I think that your very astute point about comparing the revelations that people have when encountering relics of any sort of numinous origin, comparing that to the placebo effect, I think is very astute in, the, in terms of the fact that something about us plays a very strong role in these encounters. And if that so happens to mean that inside of us, we each have a wild man waiting to get out <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> we project that into the woods and that's what we end up seeing. Maybe that's it. I mean, all I know is that, you know, what is it now? 70 years, at least in this country, in terms of popular culture, 70 plus ish years of trying to prove this thing as a large hairy hominid really hasn't gotten much of anywhere. Yes. Well said. And as we're kind of getting to the end of the road here, I figured maybe we could close this out by all giving a favorite story of some sort. I would probably pull this one from your short section on healing and spirituality. I loved this story. It says, uh, Yakima Indian fire guard told investigator W.J. Vogel that Quote, a large man with red eyes came to live with the tribe. Whenever any of the Indian people became sick, he would heal them. When the large hominid noticed his own health failing, he asked the tribe to take him to a specific location where he died. And a large flying object came down from the skies, put his body on board, and flew off into the sky. I mean, wow. Again, what the hell? <laughs> That's a, a pretty fun one. But do you guys have personal favorites we haven't touched on? I kind of want to talk about Ape Canyon, but Tim, that's kind of your thing. If you want to, use, <laughs> if you if you don't want to use that as an example, I'll I'll use Ape Canyon as. An Go example. ahead, you take Ape Canyon. Yeah. So, for anyone who isn't aware, Ape Canyon is a very famous encounter with Bigfoot, in 1924 near Mount St. Helens. The short version that you get, and it occurs in a lot of Bigfoot literature, especially flesh and blood literature, is that Beck and several other miners were trapped in this cabin in the mountains, and they were basically assaulted under siege by these large, hairy creatures that were throwing boulders at the cabin. If you sort of unpack Beck's account, it seems like maybe it was just throwing rocks at the cabin, but the other thing that's interesting is that it's another classic example of this weird washing that we see time and again. So people tend to focus on that Bigfoot assault, but what they don't talk about is the fact that the miners were led to their claim by a white arrow in the sky. They don't talk about the fact that among the sort of spirit guides that they encountered, one was a Native American man, and the other one was a female entity that is not described, but is named Vander White. So you have that lady in white connection there as well, which they actually ended up naming the mining claim after the Vander White mining claim. But even curiouser, people don't tend to talk about that just before their attack from the Bigfoot, that several of the miners actually saw a pair of footprints, a pair of large Bigfoot footprints on a sandbar that was, what was it, 100 feet from the nearest shore? I think they said it was at least, I think it was in the middle of an acre wide sandbar, they said. Yeah. So a huge sandbar. And the quote was that, you know, it almost looked as if something dropped something down and then picked it back up. And then, you know, people don't tend to address the fact that there were reports that occurred during the Ape Canyon sighting as well. Literally, a pencil appeared in Fred Beck's hand. Now, some people have liked to sort of criticize Fred Beck, because even though he is the primary witness of the encounter, he had a longstanding history of being involved and being interested in the paranormal. But at the same time, if you believe witnesses, you've got to believe witnesses. And Fred Beck never once assumed that these were giant monkey men. He always assumed that these were somehow some type of entity that had one foot in our world and one foot in the other world as well. 
It's amazing to me that this Ape Canyon story gets so sanitized and that there's all this real absolute high strangeness that surrounds the encounter that people just don't tend to talk about because it doesn't fit their pre-existing hypothesis that we're dealing with a large relic hairy hominid. So I have a real soft spot, let's say, that I nurture for the Ape Canyon case. Hmm. Yeah, I'm really glad that was the one you chose because that is one of the rare stories you could bring up where I actually have some context because when I was up there in Washington, you know, Ape Canyon butts up against what they call Ape Cave, which is a 12,000 foot long lava tube. I think it's the largest known lava tube in the United States and I have walked it. Nice. <laughs> and it is the longest underground walk I've ever had. I actually think it's the only underground walk I've ever taken, but the whole time you can see these little ridges and it's like I can almost see in my mind's eye some Bigfoot staring at me. It was a pretty cool experience, but I didn't know that added context about the story either. I only really knew about them throwing the rocks against the cabin and stuff like that. So, yeah, that is definitely interesting. And it is a place where it does seem like a perfect setting for some kind of paranormal experience. Of course, now there's so many people going up and down the cave that you know, it's not quiet enough to really see anything or have an experience like that, but it could be a window area. I definitely like that story, but Tim, what you got? Well, it's so hard to pick one story. I mean, the opening story is a favorite, obviously the one we talked about, the Fayette County, Pennsylvania story we talked about in the beginning. And in general, one of my favorite sections to write was the Christmas time of the wild man section, where I talk about all of the correlations between the wild man phenomenon and these various Christmas wild men we have from Krampus to Belsnickel and so forth. But if I'm just going to talk about one story, there was one that was pretty incredible. It was a guy named Rick who he appeared on a podcast called the Cryptid Brothers Investigation. Mm. His encounter took place in Woodville, Texas in 1978. He was driving about 2.30 in the morning. He comes up over a hill and he hits something. And he said it spun his truck around, whatever it was, it was so big, it actually like spun his pickup truck around. He gets out of the truck and he thinks it's somebody in a Halloween costume. And he's thinking, what have I done? And, and this thing that he thinks is a person at first is just, you know, sitting on the roadside kind of moaning. I think he said it had part of his grill stuck in its leg. He ends up walking up to it and figuring out that it's this Bigfoot creature. It's a female. And he ends up using his belt to put a tourniquet on its leg and, you know, motions that it's going to hurt uh, to take this piece of the truck grill out of its leg and apparently does. And there, he says there's a male Bigfoot that comes up behind him that thinks he's hurting her and she warns the male off and somehow in Bigfoot language tells him it's okay. And while he's doing this, while he's supposedly helping this Bigfoot creature, he's a Catholic, he's got a crucifix around his neck and she grabs this crucifix and says gulaka gulaka and he somehow gets the impression that she wants it so he said he takes it off and he has that and a chain and like another chain he puts these two chains together to make it big enough to put over the bigfoot's head and you know drapes this crucifix over her head and she holds it and points to the sky and says gulaka gulaka and he says no 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 jesus christ and he said i'm scared now i give her anything she wants and she was thrilled to have that but she identified it Gulaka, Gulaka. I don't know what that means. <laughs> so it's just this wonderful, incredible story of this guy who has this encounter with this creature and ends up giving it this crucifix from around his neck and drapes it on her neck. You know, it's pretty outrageous, but it's a really, really neat story. Yeah, that is a great one, too. I love it. Well, guys, this has been a fun time. The book is excellent. Of course, I've come to expect nothing less from Josh, and this is just volume one. What can you tell the people about picking it up and what they should know about Volume 2? Volume 2 will hopefully be here before the end of 2020. That's the goal. It looks like we're going to make that right now, but, you know, so many things happened with Volume 1 that kind of pushed the release date on us that I'm cautious about saying it'll definitely be here. But let's say I'm cautiously optimistic that we will make that Christmas time release date for Volume 2. So, Volume 1, we called folklore volume two we call it evidence we'd like to say that there's plenty of folklore in volume two and plenty of evidence in volume one those are just sort of signifiers we gave there's more kind of direct evidence in volume two and more folklore in volume one but there's plenty of both in each 
so you can find volume one on Amazon. Either look up Where the Footprints End or Joshua Cutchin or Timothy Renner. It should get it to you. And I'm sure at this point you can also order it in to your local bookstore if you prefer that. Very cool. Awesome. And if the people wanted to follow up with you guys, tell them where to find you in this vast internet thing. You can find me at joshuacutchin.com. Hopefully now that <laughs> now that this book is getting out of the way a little bit, I'll be making more frequent appearances over on where to the road go.com, which I've done some shows with Tim on that podcast as well in the past and hope to incorporate that more into life as we move forward. You find me at strangefamiliars.com. That's my podcast, but all that contact information goes directly to me. So if you want to get in touch with me, I'm there. If you want to hear my podcast, that's there as well. Strangefamiliars.com. Boom. Awesome. Well, Thank you guys both for your time. Again, really enjoyed the book. And it's a beautiful thing to get to decide what you find important and what you want to do in this life. So kudos to both of you and keep doing what you do. Take care out there. Thank Thanks you. Thanks so much, Greg. You got it. The power of Christ compels you people. Three is the magic number. Joshua Cutchin, Timothy Renner. What better guests for a Squatch cast? Viruses come and go, but cryptids are always their people. <laughs> but I see any new work from Joshua Cutchin, and I'm jumping in on it. I don't care if Western society is walking itself off a cliff. I kid, I kid. But I absolutely think cryptids are real and that they are a clue to how reality is structured. If your model for reality cannot handle mothmen and dogmen and fairies and Bigfoot, well, get another model because people are interacting with something. Is it some rogue coder fucking with the simulation by adding strange creatures? Are we in some planetary zoo where we occasionally see the zookeepers venture into the cage? Could our weird thoughts and dreams become physical manifestations, even if they're brief? These are big questions, and they are about much more than a monkey man in the woods, as Josh might say. So I do think this kind of research is profound and also timeless, because these mysteries will long outlive Bill Gates or Donald Trump or Jeffrey Epstein, for that matter. But I loved it, I needed it, and I only want more. I hope you feel the same, and if you only heard the first free hour of the show, I hope you're compelled to sign up for the Higher Side Chats Plus, you're only hearing half the show every week if you're listening to the free show. It is how I pay the bills, but more importantly, it's more conspira info paratainment for your very hungry brain, which has to be getting tired of the beat of the same five drums all throughout this chaotic year. In today's Plus show, we talked about thoughts, the imaginal, and realness, feeding unseen forces, sacrifice and spiritual bargains, gifting, offering, and intention, Bigfoot in the grimoires. I absolutely think it's possible that cryptids are just ritual manifestations that got out of the circle or things that jumped through a summoning that wasn't properly closed. I'm all into that. We talked about Bigfoot and the woman in white, Bigfoot logic and intelligence, telepathic Bigfoot messages, and the UFO Bigfoot overlap. Lots of fun stuff. And of course, stories, which are my favorite part of these kinds of episodes. And the book obviously has way more than we could ever talk about. But subscribe to the paid second hour because you like it and you want to double your experience, double your fun, if for no other reason. But Where the Footprints End is such a great title for this book, and I was very happy to have them on. The next show is also with two guests, but for the people who don't like racial history and that kind of stuff, they're not going to like that episode. But we're going to get crazy after that, I'm thinking. I really liked Bruce Fenton. I really liked today. And I just want to get back to being all over the map. <laughs> and I think once we get through a couple I have recorded, we got just the guests on the schedule to do that. And I guess I'm getting out of here. I hope you're all staying sane and being your best selves. 
I declare this meeting of the Midnight Society closed. I've done my part. Your move, cryptid hunters, MIB-like agents, and secret keepers of the cult of Squatch. Your fucking move. Woke up this morning with light in my eyes And then realized it was dark outside it was a light coming down from the sky I don't know who or why Must be those strangers that come every night Whose saucer-shaped light put people up tight Blue-green footprints that glow in the dark I hope they get home all right Hey, Mr. Spaceman Won't you please take me along I won't do anything wrong in my beer my toothpaste was smeared I opened my window they'd written my name said so long we'll see Uh-huh.